sober times and kind of perfect timing to be talking about this stuff considering what's happening in Texas. But before we get to the politics, um, I wanted to ask you guys about yourselves as writers, how you got into environmental writing um, and how you integrate that into your work, uh, your own experience into your work. So let's start with Mary Ellen. <clears throat> well, thank you, Susan. And also <clears throat> thank you to the library. I'm a huge fan and booster of the library as you know the ultimate um, instrument of democracy par exemplar. And my book, my most recent book, Citizen Science Scientist, is, um, is about really a, a democratizing of science. And there's a wonderful environmental librarian here um, who is integrating some citizen science with the library, which is the right thing to do, and I'm really pleased to be hopefully helping her with that. So I'm resolutely an English major sort of a gal. I started out as an editor, you know, a book review editor, a travel editor. I thought when I was growing up I wanted to be an English professor. So it was, a, it was kind of a slow change for me to become so interested in science and then in the environment and in um, ecology, essentially, and it happened pretty gradually. But a very, very important moment came when I did write this book, Evidence of Evolution. It was my third book. It came out in 2009, and that was in honor of Darwin and his the centennial of his birth and the um, anniversary of On the Origin of Species. So I wrote this book to explain evolution, actually kind of hard to explain and really understand it when you drill down. <laughs> A lot, you know, what's the context for it? And all sorts of books are out there about it, but they tell you about it in one way or another, how to put it together so we could really understand what is evolution. And um, I focused on specimens from the California Academy of Sciences, and so I interviewed the taxonomists there. And taxonomists study the vast tree of life that all life forms are part of. All life forms have common ancestry, everything is related. And, and ultimately, taxonomists are making a vast genealogy of all life forms on Earth. So the, it's a very ivory tower science taxonomy, but today, with this mass extinction going on, it's a particularly important ivory tower science. But when I was researching that book over and over again, I kept hearing, and this is 2007 and eight when I'm researching this book, the scientists were telling me, plants and animals are disappearing at a rate and magnitude equaling that which took out the dinosaurs. We're in an extinction. We're in a mass extinction. Now, Elizabeth Colbert's book, probably most of you have read it or heard about it, Sixth Extinction, that came out in 2014. This is well before that. And I'm like, what? You know, what are they talking about? And it took me a long time. It took me months and several, you know, talking to one after another of them to really grok what they were telling me. And once I did, I mean, I couldn't look back. I had to say, okay, what is going on here is it is a paradigm shift in, in life on Earth. And nobody knows what's really going on. People don't understand this. And I said, okay, next book, I got to understand how this um, is happening and why. That led me to my next book, which is called The Spine of the Continent. And the spine of the continent is kind of an overview of conservation biology. Conservation biology is only about 30 years old, and it's a science founded by famous people you know, Paul Ehrlich, Jared Diamond, um, E.O. Wilson. And con conservation means to save. So this is a science actually formulated to save biodiversity, and they knew then, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, that what they saw the processes they saw in motion were only going to get bigger, only going to get worse, and they said if we're going to do anything about this, we have to quantify it. So conservation biology was set up to quantify extinction, essentially. And the spine of the continent is the Alaska to Mexico, um, and there's, there's a lot of reasons to focus on that particular mega linkage to describe some of why we know extinction happens, how it does, and what we still have to save. And then I'm on that book, I'm researching that book, and I'm thinking, God bless nonprofits, God bless university professors. They're not, what they're doing day in and day out is making zero impact in, uh, in terms of really the forces that are set against nature. And I um, could really see up close and personal what was happening and thought, well, what could possibly scale? What could happen 
that would actually meet the level of um, destruction that's actually happening. And I worked on a couple of citizen science projects as part of that book. They weren't called citizen science, but they were regular people contributing data over long periods of time to scientists who used their data to show long-term patterns of change. So this goes all the way back to Darwin. We see where species are when and how those patterns change. That's how we know what's true, what's happening, what's real. You need data across decades. There aren't enough scientists to get that data, but there are people like you and me to get that data. And the thing that I saw about citizen science was all kinds of people did it. Republicans, Democrats, old people, young people, rich people, poor people, black people, brown people, everybody. And nobody talked about any of that. We talked about what we were doing with nature. And then the most important thing is that the data was used to achieve concrete conservation outcomes. So one project was helped reform grazing regulations in Utah, and one helped determine where highway overpasses would be built in the state of Arizona so that plants, so that animals could move across highways without getting hit by cars. And historic animals are moving north as the climate is changing. So that's my long answer. I said, okay, citizen science, this has the potential to scale. And in 2012, I said, I'm going to write my next book about citizen science. And then the whole thing boomed. I mean, I hit it right. I hit it maybe a little early, but I hit it at the right time. And basically due to smartphone technology, computing power, and statistical analysis, the, and the understanding that ecology, the developments in ecology have shown us, there's no such thing as one-off uh, processes that occur. Everything is totally connected at different scales, local, regional, continental, global. The only way you can get all those scales is by massive num amounts of data. And there's a lot of people doing this, and it's burgeoning all over the place. So it's a fantastic thing. It, I have complete hope and um, trust that we're going to use it more and more to actually even change how we understand how life on Earth unfolds and to also focus in on what, needs, what we need to do to make sure that it does keep unfolding. Great. So um, it sounds like for you, uh, sort of the emotional heart and the, the connection for you into environmental writing was uh, uh, the, this awareness of extinction, the sense of loss, and the sense of grief over that. You cut your teeth on the movement. So tell me a bit about that. What was it like growing up with Dave Brower? And, kind of where you came into it. Yes, my, uh, my experience was the exact opposite of Mary Ellen's. I was indoctrinated from the cradle in this. There's no way I could escape it. You know? um, my dad became the first ED of the Sierra Club in, in um, 1952, but by then he'd already been doing, he and Ansel Adams had worked together to, to, to make King, Kings Canyon National Park when he was still a very young man. So my dad was one of these guys who lived in, lived in and slept it. He, enormous energy. He, it's all he thought about. Uh, he brought it home to the family dinner table. There was no audience too small for my father. <laughs> you know, his four little kids, he would try to evangelize. We had no chance. Uh, we we're totally helpless little kids. And, and um, so, in fact, as a, as a because he, what, we were early in the game. This was my father in becoming the, the ED of the Sierra Club, uh, became only the second full-time employee of the Sierra Club. The first was a, was a secretary, Virginia Ferguson. So his becoming an ED he doubled the staff of the Sierra Club. But there's still only two people. And when you think of the Sierra Club today, I mean, I don't know, it's like 800 staff and they're all over the country. So these ideas, when I was a kid in the 50s, these ideas were new. And one of the things I did, because I'd been so indoctrinated, I discovered that in school essays, I could get my blood up, and I could get really uh, emotional about things on cue, um, because I had all these arguments, and automatic A each time. So I was sort of like a little grade school hack, you know? Um, and, and even at the time, I knew that there's something a little, I was getting myself, I, I, was, I was using it, you know? And, and I, and I you know, even in like like 10 years old, I realized, is this quite right, what I'm doing? But, but um, Do you remember any of the things you wrote? 
You know, um, the one thing I wrote when I was 14, my dad put in the Sierra Club Bulletin. It was, it was, <laughs> it was on, um, it was on uh, Moby Dick. But um, I, uh, that's how I really began uh, uh, this writing thing. My, I finished my freshman year at Berkeley. And my dad was doing, um, at this point, he and Ansel and Nancy Newell had started this exhibit format series, these big books that nobody had ever heard of before you. They were a new genre. Um, uh, when my father first proposed to bookstores we're going to do this 11 by 14 book, they said, well, we can't sell a book like that. It's, we don't have shelves for a book like that. And we've seen the future. I mean, it's now the past. But, but you know, they broke coffee tables all over the land uh, <laughs> it, it, soon, soon enough. But he, he was having a, um, on the 10th book, he was having a problem with the editor. It was a book of, um, that would marry pictures of the Big Sur coast with um, photographs, um, with, with poetry by Michelle's father, uh, Robinson Jeffers. No, joking. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, <laughs> but, but the, the, he hired a poet to do it. The poet, um, the poet was too poetic. He didn't quite get, get it. So my father said, why don't you take a sabbatical at the end, a freshman sabbatical at the end of your freshman year, and go do this book for me. I said, Dad, I'm a freshman. He said, well, um, you're, you're an English major, aren't you? Well, I said, yeah, I haven't declared it yet, but I'm going to be an English major. And, um, and he said, well, you're, you were an artist, weren't you? And I was an artist when I was um, 12. <laughs> me and Michael Heiser, who's now famous, won the gold medal in this classic aptitude <laughs> competition when I was 13. And I said, but Dad, that, I was 13 back then. And he, said, he was one of these guys who would press. It was like, he was like the British Royal Navy in the age of sail. He would press young people into service. <laughs> and, who, and you could just be walking down the street. And, and I, again, was hapless because I was handy. So anyway, he draft, drafted me. And I, I said, OK, I'll do it. And I went down to live two weeks in Ansel's house, Ansel Adams' house in, in Carmel Highlands, foraged the country for photographs, came back, and had Ansel vet them. Are these OK, Ansel? Yeah, this one's pretty good. And Ansel would crop them. Uh, it was an amazing experience because um, I was taking pictures in from really great photographers on the coast, Wynn Bullock and, and the Westons. And, and Ansel had the sort of presumption to, to take these pieces of paper. And I'm watching over his shoulder, and he's cropping the picture. It's just a wonderful experience to have. <laughs> wow. And all of a sudden, as, as it comes in like this, you know, there's that moment where bing, you know, inevitability. Can't move one piece of paper anymore. And he's doing this to the photographs of these, these famous photographers. Anyway, so I, I do that book. Mm -hmm. And it's a very successful book. I, I, um, oh, that's the other thing he told me when I said, I'm just a freshman. And I'm just, you know, I, I'm a, I haven't been an artist for a long time. And, and he said, well, you did watch where when Ansel and Nancy and me put this is the American Earth together, the first of the books. And I said, you know, that's right. Because I had watched. I was the fly on the wall while these three people put this first book together. And I just, I still remember the, the creative excitement of these people as they did it. They knew they were onto something new and amazing. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, it was such a process because Nancy, um, this is the 50s. Everybody was drinking then. They all, everybody drinks now, but they, they really drank in those days. So my dad and, and Nancy were big. My dad and Ansel were big people, and they could handle alcohol. Nancy, after a certain part of the evening, couldn't handle her alcohol. And I remember a couple of times where uh, this moment when she would say, even I'm, I'm about eight years old, and, I, and, I, and she says something that's, that's really off the wall. It just doesn't compute. And I remember Ansel and my dad looking at each other, whoop, you know, that's it for tonight, you know? <laughs> and then they would pour this huge one, you know, to, to, to go away with, but. Oh, I liked in your book, um, uh, Ken's book is interviews with 19 different people who worked with his dad. And almost every one of those interviews, they talk about going out with your father and drinking martinis and him drinking them under the ta table. <laughs> you could not stay with my dad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried to stay with him once. I remember six martinis in New York. Once. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, it was nothing to him, but I was just, you know. Yeah. yeah. But, but um, anyway, I'm going to finish this up. But, <laughs> but I went. Um, so I go back to, I go back to, my, to Cal. Uh, to, to start my fresh, after this experience, I get all these honor courses because I'm an editor of a book, you know, and, and um, 
I, uh, I do my six months. At the end of the six months, my dad says, well, I, um, you can finish your sophomore year or you can go down with Elliot Porter for four months to the Galapagos Islands and do a book for me on the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was <laughs> the end of my formal education. And, and I did 14 more books, writing and editing 14 more books for him, environmental books for Sierra Club and Friends of the Earth. Then I finally made my, made my escape and, uh, I, and uh, went off on my own. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's cool. That's cool. So Great both story. of you. Um, let, let's talk a little bit since the, the evening has been billed as a um, discussion of Trump. Um, let's talk a bit about where we are with, with Trump, um, both what you see happening right now and given your longtime experience as environmental writers, put it in some context for us. Um, Take it away from the one. Well, in both, when I wrote The Spine of the Continent and then Citizen Scientist, both in both processes, I realized there's no, um, there's no differentiating, there's no teasing out what's happening with the environment from the forces of history. And history of the hum humans on Earth in the last 100, 200 years has been about colonialism, taking of territory, often from indigenous people, and developing land, um, and, and over extracting resources. So the forces of history are creating the environmental crisis that we are in. Trump did not create it. Um, he's taking you know, this ridiculous stand. By the way, in, in terms of what we can actually physically do right now with Trump, Zinke, our Secretary of the Interior, has delivered, and I don't think that this has been revealed yet. I didn't read the Times today. But Zinke has delivered this his report on his recommendations for what to do about the national monuments to Trump. It has not been uh, revealed what he said. Uh, nobody kind of knows why, except that the the anniversary of the, the national park system is August 26th. Maybe, maybe remind people what, what is at stake here. So Zinke has reviewed all of the protections of the national monuments of, of, the, of America, the United States, and he is obviously going to be recommending that the protections be unrolled, pulled back, and that extractive industries are allowed to go in there and extract metals and, go, and oil and gas. And um, this is a disaster, and it should not happen, and it's ridiculous. Um, and what you can do when this gets revealed, which will be any day, is, is start writing letters and get on the internet and, and object. We have to really make a big stink out of it. Um, these national monuments have protected for a reason. And you know, as evidenced by the sixth mass extinction, we lose the plants and animals because they lose their habitat. So these places are very, very important habitat for creatures. And by the way, what we don't understand is that we actually need these natural systems for even human life to go on. And so we're actually a self-consuming system here. We're eating out um, of, our, of the very ground of our own being by taking away these national, the, this functioning ecological landscape. So Trump, um, here's what's the bright side of no shadow without light. We have to do it ourselves. This is happening on many, many levels with Trump. People are understanding women's rights, um, you know, gender identification rights, immigrant rights. We have to take local control and be active personally. This is not, this could not be more important to be active personally in the environment. And I'm just going to say that the environment is the biggest issue of them all because without the environment, all of those other things go way, way down. The minute we start having like really, really um, scarce resources, like scarce fresh water, what's going to happen to women's rights? What's going to happen to immigrants' rights? Nothing good. Whatever you care about, add the environment in. I mean, you're all here tonight, thank you. But everybody who is really invested in these other issues, I wish we didn't see them as separate issues because they're all connected. And so for me, Trump is about Forget it, we have to do it ourselves. And here's the thing about citizen science, is we can do it ourselves. And there's immense amounts of free uh, software, free databases, free projects to actually visualize information that then creates a case that you take to your county, state, um, and federal officials to, to argue for why something needs to be protected. Ken, you made the point when we were talking about 
what we were going to talk about tonight, that this is nothing new, that what we're seeing with yeah. Trump is we've seen before, we've been there before. What are the lessons to draw from those previous yeah, um, examples? Zinke seems so bad now, and he is, but um, we don't, don't want to forget James Watt under Reagan. <laughs> I mean, remember, what you, remember how you felt back then? I mean, there was a character. I mean, Zinke. <laughs> I mean, he was, he, there was something reptilian about the guy. I, I mean, I like lizards, but this guy. Yeah, that's an uh, insult to the lizards. Yeah, it's insult to the lizards. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but then don't forget um, uh, Gail Norton under, under Bush. Yeah. The stuff these, these interior secretaries did was terrible, and we got over it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's happened before. This is not exactly end of times, you know. But, but um, I, uh, I, I'm just thinking about what you're saying about the science, you know, one of the wonderful things that, that our citizen scientists and government scientists have done is protect this information, protect the global data. It was one of the first things they did. It's like these people who, who took the, 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 um, the, the Muslim library out of, out of Timbuktu. They ran in there and said, we've got to save this stuff. And they've, they were very worried, justifiably, that that information would disappear. All this climate science that has been assembled is, is these people protected. So we have a lot of institutional uh, people working for us, people in the departments who care about this. People in the Park Service have, have been pretty good. Uh, you know, people, people in EPA are pretty shell-shocked, but, um, but uh, we have it cut out for us. I, I also like to think, let's, let's think post-Trump, um, too. And let's, you know, we spin our wheels in Trump mud so much, you know, every day, every treat, tweet. We need to get over that. And, and I keep thinking, what do we do? This can't happen again. You know, we can't let something like this happen again. And uh, not just for environment, but for democracy. And, again, you said? Yeah, uh, we can't have another Trump type episode. We have to, we have to, this is so dangerous, not just the environment, to the to life on earth, to, to our cities. I mean, there's that red button, you know? Um, we, can't, we can't let this happen again. So we need to be working toward that. Uh, systemic changes, electoral college changes, stuff that, um, long range stuff to stop. This is just an episode, but we can't have too many more of these episodes. Well, something that, that you said, Mary Ellen, um, struck me. I mean, you were saying that, you know, the environment is sort of at the core, whether you're concerned about women's rights, you know, civil rights or whatever. But, you know, one of the blasts against the environmental movement has always been that it's a white middle class, upper middle class movement. So how do you pull that now, you know how do you, how do you pull in those other people or is that an anachronistic no i mean i think there the, certainly the uh, environmentalists um, all over the place are very concerned about about trying to connect with other kinds of constituencies than than white people older white people about the environment um, i wish that the environmental movement would not and i'd be so interested what you think ken i mean I wish that the environmental movement would not flagellate itself over this. I mean, we have, it's like, let's look at Planned Parenthood, who's really supporting that. Probably old white people are doing that too. Um, you know, we're part, that's an establishment um, demographic that has money and time to put into social causes. Um, you know, it's really an interesting thing happened in, in the state of California uh, and I'm forgetting who did this, but somebody aggregated all of the Instagram and Facebook um, pictures of what people were taking in the state parks. And actually, there's a lot of people of color, a lot of people of different socioeconomic demographics in the state parks, and they've been taking pictures of themselves having fun in the state parks. But the state park people who are running it haven't necessarily seen them. So the tagline was, there's a party going on in the state parks, but we don't know about it. So actually, you know, lots of different cultural groups do care about the environment. Um, you know, it, it's a messy kind of thing. It's, it feels like a, um, it feels like a luxury to care about the environment, that it's something that wealthier people can do. Mm -hmm. But the, the social and environmental justice movements are just, just hugely important. And they are very much integrating with, with um, you know, the more, the more white people ones. Look, I mean, the thing is, like, we have Syrian refugees that are climate change refugees. That is a social and, you know, environmental justice issue. 
that's happening. So if you care about but though the people that are the refugees themselves, are they saying, I care about the environment first? No, they care about their freaking survival first. Um, but their survival actually depends on the environment. The, everybody needs to understand that our survival depends on the environment. Although we don't frame it that way. I mean, no, we I don't. think that's... Well, in fact, I think I, the argument made that the, the Syrians actually heard about environment first. I mean, it was in this, this drought that, that preceded what's happening now. I agree with you on self-flagellation. I, I think we do too much of that. Number one, I think it's a totally bunk charge. You're elitist. I mean, right. watch the next guy on the trail you see, the next kid on the trail, and tell me how elite he is. I mean, it's a total bullshit argument. And um, and I the agree. same, and the same with um, you know, same with our whiteness. You know, I, black folks, if you want to join, join the movement. You know, I my own family's black. My wife's. I've been married to two black women. So um, um, it's a it's a rut I'm in, but but uh, but um, but but uh, I way back with my first wife, I I ran for the chapter, the, uh, the SF chapter, the Sierra Club, the Bay chapter, on the grounds let's diversify, and I couldn't get anybody in my family in there. My my in laws, you know, they had other stuff to worry about. It was that was the '60s. They were getting there, you know. They were the police dogs and hoses, but but. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to apologize anymore. If you want to join the movement, join the movement. Yeah, do I, it. The, everybody's been trying to get you in every environmental outfit I know has been trying to get you in. Come on in, you know. So there's this is one of the reasons why I think citizen science has such an incredible potential because it is it can be addressed like purely as a social justice kind of thing. Like most of the way that um, exploitation has happened of peoples and lands is by you know taking over territories that belong to other people or ignoring you know when when a, the citizen scientist uh, C citizen science association conference this it was in May and the main speaker was the gal. Uh, how um, a single mom, I think she's a single mom, who was the whistleblower in Detroit, who said, my water is tainted. And she went to officials who said, oh, your kids are just not that bright. And she said, no, they are bright, but something is wrong with the water. And she got this professor from the University of Richmond to come and bring in postdocs and, and grad students this is a citizen science project. They then uh, empowered people in Detroit to test the water and keep the data and to make documentation of, of what was happening with the water. This woman is a citizen scientist. That's what citizen science is. So citizen science is a free, available platform for any community of people to use to create data and to make it spatially and visually explicit to show it to other people, to make a case for defending territory and defending quality of things like water and and air. Do you think it? Oh, go ahead. Well, let me just say, I, I, I think you're right uh, about this business about environment and underlying all these other causes. My dad used to say that. He he would say, this is the one thing we absolutely have to get right. We can mess up some of the others, but this one we have to get right because. And, and his line was, there'll be no art, there'll be no music, there'll be no science, exactly. there'll be no social justice, there'll be love, music on a dead planet. And um, this is where we live. And, and, and this, is, uh, this, is the, this underlies every single cause, important cause we have. I really agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you get to people who don't see that? Um, I mean, I was thinking about Arlie Hochschild had that book this year where she talks about... Um, the ways in which all these people living in Chemical Alley in Louisiana are totally aware of the pollution around them and the way in which it is just destroying their lives and yet don't make the political jump from that to... Um, they're dying of their own poisons. I read her book. I mean, they, they have cancer because of where they live and they still are taking this other position. But, you know, I mean, we're all writers, the three of us here. I think that we're probably all kind of constantly thinking, where's the story? Where's the way to tell the story? Where you get the connection, the emotional connection that opens the heart and mind of the reader to this other information that softens the barriers to that. I mean, her book is a good example because these people, to me, I felt like they were just very defensive. They very much wanted to... Um, 
have some kind of power that they did not feel that they had. And taking the position that they took, they felt like they were aligning themselves with powerful forces. Yeah, they were, like their own death. But, you know, the, with chemical companies. Right. But this is, um, I think, to the point, and I think, you know, Ken has such an amazing story with David Brower being your dad, of, of this generational understanding and connection that really is from the heart of what you take in from someone you love and how you see the world. You know, I wrote about my father's death in my book partly because it intersected so amazingly with some of the things I was trying to convey about um, observation. He was a writer, he taught me to write to be a writer based on observation, and you think of your dad teaching you to observe and also empowering you to be creative in, with these, I mean, I don't know, I think that's what we have to do and more of us mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. Connecting people. You know, and there's a wonderful book by Terry Tempest Williams yeah. called Refuge, for example, in which she, this is her classic book, um, her mother's dying of breast cancer and she goes, she goes through all of these birds in Utah and, and goes through the death of her mother, and, but she also highlights all of these birds. And she just so seamlessly connects the process of her own understanding of her mother's death, the process of her mother's death, and the natural world, which is still there to sustain us through these you know, huge developmental moments in our life. And to me, this is what is at stake. We, if we don't have nature, for example, where's our consolation? Where do we go? You want to take a walk in the woods when you experience something big, a loss or, or love or any kind of moment in your life. What if there's no woods to walk in? I mean, are we nuts? Yes, we're kind of nuts. Um, I guess the first thing you'd have to say is we're not succeeding. Um, no, so true. Um, not just environmental writers, but envir environmental movement. Um, in, in the list of concerns uh, of American citizens is down there around 10 usually. So we're not doing it. And, uh, and it is a, how, and as this question, how do we do it better? I don't know the answer. Um, my own thing is long form, which is really not the way to do it. Um, to, to, why, why do you say that? Because nobody's reading anything but, but you know, but sound bites anymore. Mm -hmm. I used to think that, that, that at least, you know, and it's true, and it's still partly true, that in the place it appears, if you appear in the New Yorker or the Atlantic, you are, you are influencing people who count. There was once this class of people who, it's horrible, but this class of people who made things happen. I'm not sure that's as true anymore. Um, so, so for me, the long form is even less and less. If you're a writer, you want to write well. One of the things that people keep saying is, uh, um, correctly is that the, that the right has found the language to get to people. We have not. And, uh, but the trouble is this mendacious language. Um, we don't want to do that. Do we? I mean, I, I don't want to do that. So it really is this dilemma. Um, I, I think it's very tough. And, and I think it's, um, it, it is very tough to get beyond preaching to the choir, which I think certainly every time I've ever appeared on environmental things, that's who is in the, the audience. audience. It's people who have already been convinced of these problems. Um, and I don't know how you get past them. I, I don't know how you get to people. Your dad, in, in your book, there was a quote, somebody quoted your dad saying, you cannot reason prejudice out of a person because it didn't get in that way. And I thought, OK. <laughs> so it's emotional. Yeah. But I will say something that I think we should all do, which is talk about it all the time. Um, bum people out at the dinner parties that you go to, like talk about extinction. <laughs> really, I always do it. I'm very popular. <laughs> <laughs> like Mary Ellen. The prop, the prop. I only had one glass of wine. What happens after you've had three? Well, I get even worse. But I mean, if I will say that if you go into any Denny's across the United States today, I bet you everybody in those Denny's knows the term climate change. They might tell you that they don't believe in it, but they know what you're talking about. And I think secretly they know it's real. But do they know biodiversity loss? No, because even professional scientists in other fields don't know about biodiversity loss. There's a scientist that I you know, kind of keep tabs on at Stanford. His name is um, Rodolfo Dirzo. And he, he recently had a paper out about this 
you know, n not only the extinction of, you know, the termination of the entire lineages of life forms that is accelerated today, but this huge amount of numbers of bodies of wildlife, of vertebrates and birds, which are vertebrates, you know, mammals, every, everything has decreased by like 40% since 1970. Now, why do we need, why does that matter? Well, here's one reason why it matters. Those bodies are actually, um, they're keeping us healthy because, so let's say we cut down the Amazon, the Amazon has plants and, in it that have co-evolved with viruses for millions of years. And you cut down the plants and then the mammals and the birds and the reptiles and, and amphibians go because they don't have habitat, but the viruses don't go. And hello Ebola, hello Zika, they look for a host and they find a super abundant big mammal, that's us. And Rodolfo also, so he coined this term defaunation of planet Earth, which I find sort of a horrible word, but very descriptive. And another one, rodentification. So when you lose all this biodiversity of other types of biodiversity, what, what booms? Rats, rats do. And rats are also disease vectors. So, you know, people in the Presidio, there's a coyote population in the Presidio and people have conflicts with their dogs all the time. <laughs> and they want the coyotes like taken out of the Presidio, but the the, uh, the coyotes keep the rat population under control. So this is the reasons of why we need the bodies of, of, of plants and animals. So we need to just talk about that. Like it's not gonna be easy necessarily to live with coyotes, for example, nearby, but we actually have to figure out how to do that for our own health. Well, you're talking about sort of reinforcing the idea of the interconnectedness of exactly the system that we live in. And you know, that it's a fantasy that we can be separate from it. And I actually love to hear, you know, Ken talk about the fantasies that people have about uh, human life being kind of in a pod that could just be sort of shot up to Mars. And um, maybe that will save us. Yeah, there's this idea uh, that a lot of people have that we're actually doing pretty well in managing natural systems or, or farming systems. This idea that, well, if, if this, this web of life that, that nurtured us and created us and sustains us was gone, well, we'll be able to muddle on through. And, and it, that completely ignores the history of our record in trying to manage natural systems or even how badly we farm. Um, um, you know, the dust bowls and stuff. We're not through that. Every generation of, of scientists and technicians thinks, oh, well, we've got it not now. Now we understand how this system works. We can reproduce it. No, you can't. Because no. every time you try it, you screw up. I mean, the, the list is amazing. So this is an illusion everybody has, that, that we can somehow operate independently of this. I did a piece on a guy I love, Freeman Dyson. I did a book on him and his, called The Starship and the Canoe, him and his son. He believes this. He's a very bright man. But he somehow thinks that we can, because he's so smart, that humanity's smart enough to, to do this. We're not. And, and that thinking forgets that even the smartest of people is but a subset of the bigger thing of nature. So we can really probably never know, we, the, the human brain can't like encompass nature because nature encompasses the human brain. But so much of human experience has been positing that humans exist outside of nature. It's different, it's separate, it's the park, it's the forest, it's the mountains, it's not the whole enchilada. At the same time, exactly. we, get, we get told, we, we get this complaint, well, you, um, you're, you, this man-nature dichotomy. Uh, you people, you environmentalists, man is part of nature. Well, yes and no. Um, it happens that the, the man-nature, the human-nature dichotomy happens to be a very uh, uh, effective way of describing our problem, that there is a dichotomy. Yeah. You know? And um, for environmental writers, I think, um, number one, one of the things we, we can't keep doing, and most and many of us have learned this, is doomsay them to death. It, it gets so depressing. Um, you, and I've learned this long ago back in the Sierra Club, you cannot just bombard them with gloom and doom. You have to leave some hope there. And, and you have to tell story. You have to find a different way to, to um, convey this. An awful lot of our environmental writing is very the same. There's a kind of reporting... That, that's predict predictable. You need to, I'm sure you're doing with some of the stuff you're doing, that, that, that um, you gotta tell story that's gripping as story mm -hmm. and, and, and be an actual writer. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just, I'll say what I'm working on right now. My uh, very good friend of mine, Tony de Broom, who's the foreign secretary of the Marshall Islands, and is a great uh, climate change advocate. He's the guy 
talking to the UN all the time. He died on the 22nd. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm going back to, to a thing I wrote about him way back in 1980 when I was going through, I did four books on Micronesia. I was going through Micronesia and um, hooked up with him, found this dictionary he was making. As a student, he made something called the Tukjine. It was the Marshallese English Dictionary. And, and I read in this book, um, I absolutely fell in love with this book. What you learn about a people from 600 pages of their dictionary, how they see the world. Um, when he started feeding fishing terms, and he didn't even know, this computer started smoking and burning. Fishing terms just come out <laughs> forever. This incredible variety, canoe terms. Uh -huh. you, um, for some reason, Marshallese smell terms. It's like they have a, a heightened olfactory sense. The smell pages go on and on. <laughs> you get a sense of who these people are. So this, these people are going under. Marshall Islands mm -hmm. are, you know, average six feet above sea level. They're, they're going under. Um, so my approach in the piece I'm re revising right now is words. Words are going to be gone. All these words that are attached to these places. Mm -hmm. And in the Marshalls, there's these tiny little areas have names because they're so small. Mm -hmm. There's 70, 70 square miles of, of, um, of dry land and about 100 million miles of ocean, you know. Mm -hmm. And not that many, 2 million miles, 1 million mile of ocean, but mm -hmm. square miles of ocean. But, um, but the, the kinds of things you're losing, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. this whole worldview that you saw in this dictionary, um, it's a way to approach this problem that's not the routine way of approaching, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, approaching. And one of the reasons to not lose indigenous historical knowledge is because many of these peoples have figured out things that we don't, we don't understand and we are at pains to understand. And in my book, you know, there's a category of citizen science called co-creation. And I was looking for a story about co-creation. That's where you really have like not just the researcher saying, I'm the researcher, I'm gonna study you, but the researcher says, I have a question that I wanna ask about your people or where you live. Do you also, can you wanna collaborate with me? Is there a question that you have too that can be investigated at the same time? And the story that I found, which really changed the whole way that I wrote the book was about the Amamutsun people in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Anyway, the, the native Californians, and this is not true of indigenous people everywhere or even just in the United States, but in California, native Californians cultivated the wild without depleting wild species or domesticating them. We don't know how to do that. We domesticate animals. You know, we've got our cows and our sheep, our dogs, our cats, our birds. You know, we, we domesticate animals or we deplete them and they go extinct like grizzly bears and wolves. But the, the native Californians actually cultivated wildlife, increasing their populations, feeding themselves, and everybody lived a vibrant life together. How did they do that? The way they did it was, has specific practices associated with it, but absolutely inextricable from their culture. So these are, the th these are examples of, you know, we lose that knowledge, we actually might be losing a way forward for ourselves because we don't have a way forward if we take off all of these wild animals. The wild animals create the environment that we live in. They actually create the oxygen that we breathe and the fresh water that we drink. And uh, we, don't, we don't live without that. We can't make that ourselves. So we need those wild animals. So how are we gonna keep them, keep their populations vibrant? We don't know how to do it. This is amazingly, especially true in, in these low coral islands in the Pacific. Um, and I think it's just because there's, everybody can see that they're finite. You know, these people arrive by canoe, you come to a coral islet, you know, you start at the lagoon beach and three minutes later at the ocean beach, that's it. Yeah. There's no, it's no slash and burn, we're gonna move on to the next, right. the next forest because and this is my own theory and I'm sure it's true of why these people develop these wonderful systems for managing these small places where they can pass down for thousands of years a pristine reef um, there's things like, I mean, we'll go out there, our guys with spear guns, we'll, we'll shoot spawning grouper in the past, female grouper. And the islander says, you're going you're gonna to shoot this spawning female grouper? That's dumb. Well, yeah. that, I mean, <laughs> what, what are you thinking? Or they'll, or they'll, in a coral atoll, there'll be a number of islets together. The third and fourth and fifth, that's, that's a reserve. Yeah. And the way coral spawning goes, you're up, if you're downstream of that, you're, all, you're always going to be all right if you have a, a place that pours out all these coral spawn. So, uh, and all kinds of taboo systems. If you're in this clan, you can't eat that. 
uh, if you're in that clan, you can't. And it all uh, uh, combines to make this wonderful management system. I'll just give one example of Palau Islands, where I spent a year of my life, is our, um, they were once thought to, maintain, uh, to have been inhabited by 40,000 people. It's a big archipelago. Um, and, and they passed down this beautiful, the most beautiful reefs in the world, pristine. We've been there for 20 years, or, or now 40 years, and 15,000 people can't live there because fishing for cash, um, ignoring all the conservation rules, there's only 15,000 people. You, you look at those little village sites, there were 40,000 people, and they gave us this wonderful system. Mm -hmm. So our system isn't very good that way. Yeah. I'm gonna, um, I think we wanna open it up to questions, but first I just wanna give a plug to both of these guys' books, which I meant to do in the beginning. Um, Mary Ellen's is Citizen Scientist, and it's just a wonderful uh, sort of tour of um, the age of extinction through the lens of people doing citizen science. And then Ken's The Wildness Within, which is really interesting kind of coverage of his dad's career through the eyes of people who worked with him. So now let me open it up to questions.